Today, you're in for a treat, as I was sitting down with Stefan Haney, who is the interim CTO and one of the founding members of Foundry, a business acquiring businesses born online and looking to build them to significant scale so they'd fit under the aggregator model. He is also uh, the proud owner of a title that someone affectionately labeled him the godfather of Seller Central, which I found funny, but having spent 16 years and being involved in some of the very influential and initial teams building out Seller Central and everything that is around it, uh, you'll see as I did very quickly that he's absolutely no joke and every word that comes out of his mouth is one of sheer wisdom. We talk a bit about what it is to interview at Amazon and how that approach is uh, conducted from an interviewing perspective, how everything has meaning, what it is to plan and vision and how Foundry is approaching sort of their build out and their strategy plan. So I found it immensely valuable. I hope you do too. Hi, and welcome to Successful Scales the show where I interview now successful professionals about their journey and try and garner insights onto any tips that can be applied to your business at home. Whether it's financial freedom or the exit of your company, wherever your journey may take you, the idea here is to simply learn from those who have done it before. I hope you enjoy and you get some value out of this. Buckle up and enjoy the episode. That's new. Um, <laughs> Stefan, welcome to an episode of Successful Scales, my friend. Thank you. Good to be here, Yoni. I am, uh, yeah, I'm particularly excited to, to have the opportunity to sit down with you. Uh, we've had plenty of conversations in the past to date, and I feel like every time we sit down, I get a little bit smarter, and it's a huge opportunity for those listening at home to, to get a bit of your wisdom and to, to really share in a little bit about the vision of where you're headed. But before we dive into, I've written down a lot of questions. I did my homework. <laughs> um, before we dive into that, I'd love you to, in your own words, read the back of your baseball card rather than me try and uh, stuff it up. Sure. Well, uh, my name's Stefan Haney and it's great to, to be here. Uh, my, I currently live in, in lovely Moscow, Idaho with my wife, Megan, and our seven kids. Uh, which is a party in and of itself. We moved here about a year ago. Uh, I've had the chance to work in e-commerce, uh, particularly at Amazon and now beyond for the last uh, 17, 18 years. Uh, big stint at Amazon. I worked uh, you know, in, in uh, chronological order. I started off working in supply chain and the big hit there was uh, helping Amazon go from a media company to an everything company. And how do you change the software to do that without hiring hundreds of people? It's part of your scaling challenge. Um, hey, we're going to go from four to 40 product categories, uh, and we don't want to hire a complete buying, huge buying staff for each one. Uh, then I moved into the marketplace team from 2009, 2016. What a great time to be an Amazon third-party marketplace. Uh, owned a lot of the seller success tools and software growth, as well as policies. Um, and then uh, the last thing I did uh, at Amazon uh, was ran the Amazon detail page and got the privilege of leading that team. You know, it's, it's uh, a lot of traffic, a lot of visitors, and um, trying to invent new ways of shopping. There's just a lot of day one on the Amazon uh, product page, detail page. And then for the last couple of years, I've been uh, working uh, with uh, EMAG in Romania, uh, helping them uh, uh, expand their marketplace business. It's a great opportunity. Not a lot of people know enough about Romania. It's a great uh, economy, and their, their third-party business is booming. Uh, it's a great time for international sellers to look there. It'll be my plug. Uh, and, and, and then also most recently, uh, working with some partners to start a brand portfolio business. seems like everybody's doing it, but, uh, we think we're doing a little different and, uh, maybe better. We'll find out, but, uh, called Foundry. And so we're looking for a few great, uh, businesses and brands born online to acquire and then invest, scale and grow. I love how, uh, succinct you were in putting together, you know, 17 plus years just in the e-commerce space alone, let alone everything else that you've done. So thanks for, for sharing that, mate. But, uh, I want to dive in a little deeper because, you know, before we hit record, we talked a little bit about what it was actually like when you did join the marketplace team inside of Amazon. And I mean, I was just sitting here with, you know, my, my mouth wide open, firstly, trying to grasp that Amazon was ever that small in such fundamental teams. Um, so I think if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, it was 80 in, in the marketplace team. 
I'm, I, I, I'm going to stuff it up here. You tell me how uh, big it was you know, when you joined. Memories, <laughs> memories. Will go. You know, when I joined Amazon in 2003, there's roughly 2,500 uh, employees in Seattle at that time. Right. And that was 2003. Uh, I think there are 55,000 or something or, or much higher than that, uh, obviously now and or, uh, when I left 2019. So that's, it's just in, in 16 years to grow, you know, 10 X, you know, plus or actually 20, uh, do the math. Um, when we came to, when I came to marketplace in 2009, it was a fairly small group. It was dozens, right? We're running uh, the software and policies behind this, this $9 billion business at the time uh, with uh, just right around a million sellers, uh, which is pretty amazing. Amazon scales really well. Uh, and part of it's because the ecosystem. But then from 2009 to 2016, it was just incredible growth, right? You know, uh, nearly 2 million sellers uh, worldwide opened five different marketplaces uh, during that time frame: Japan, Canada, Mexico, uh, Italy, Spain, all opened, you know, just India, uh, third party marketplace countries. Uh, and the, the teams, so in that, that eight year period, obviously you scale the teams uh, to go from 9 billion to 150 billion plus in annual revenue. Um, it also shows up in the amount of transactions that have to be happened, the amount of seller support calls, uh, the, the pricing change, number of pricings, listings, inventory, uh, transactions that have to be supported. Um, it's a pretty, pretty big scaling challenge. And so, yeah, the team went from 80 ish, uh, to, uh, to well over, you know, to thousands. Uh, and so just even the lessons you learn in your company or being part of a company that in five years goes from 80 employees to well over a thousand employees, uh, is a big deal. I mean, it's hard to even sort of quantify or, or break down to go in such a short period of time from 80 to, you know, that I'm not going to do the math there, um, but you know, that many <laughs> times, that many times the growth here, how do you even approach the planning for scale like that in such a relatively short period? How, how are you even looking at the equation for how do we even get to into that level of diversification of talent pool of sophistication and you know and getting that many people onboarded and aligned yeah it's uh well you're hitting it right right so let's just say in five years you're going to go from a company of 100 to a company of thousand right uh so you're going to 10x the amount of employees you're going to hire well over 900 people because some people are going to choose to leave or or are not going to be able to keep up with the scale of growth and so you know, they'll need to find a place within the organization or somewhere else at Amazon or, or wherever. So hiring, let's just let's divide it up equally for fun and say you're going to hire 200 people a year, right? You're going to hire more people than you currently have on the team. Yeah. Uh, right? Break that down. Uh, yeah, break that down first, right? And then, you know, now let's talk about coordinating them to actually, because you don't need to hire, you need to get more work done. Right. And hiring is, is one of the elements to getting more work done. But hiring is a job by itself. So the first thing is we actually need to get more work done uh, in order to grow. We're going to open another country. So we need to do this much work on software. So the first thing we do to break it down is what's the work to be done and, and what work needs to be done to drive the growth that we expect and the growth that we like. Right. So, you know, there's the organic growth and then there's the incremental growth you want to launch on top. Now we now we have a sense of work. And, and the first part is, you know, what are what are, uh, you know, higher leaders uh, was was always something getting that positive. So I always hired look for the manager first or the expert because expert or senior talent will attract talent to follow them. And then managers, I can help split up. Uh, I can help share the hiring burden, right? And then those managers, like I can't hire managers to do today's job. I need to look forward and hire managers. So Amazon talks about the bar, right? The bar is simply, you know, uh, uh, someone who is, is show, demonstrates skills and capabilities better than 50% of the people in the role today and has the potential to grow. Uh, and you're getting uh, 400 invoices a month Okay, that might be a little work, uh, but now in three months from now or five months from now at the rate of growth, you're going to get 1,200 invoices per month. So the way you work today is not going to work the way uh, with tomorrow's load. So that's the expected growth piece. So hire those big leaders, 
hire senior talent um, that can not only get work done, but also invent the new ways of working that you're going to need to do. Uh, and then, you know, some other tactics that are just tactical uh, is very rarely, if you're going to start a whole new team, very rarely would I hire all new people into that team, right? Seed the talent. Uh, and then conveniently within Amazon, because you're an incubated company, uh, you know, you can look for uh, two other tactics. One, who can I attract to transfer into our group, right? Uh, you know, there's a lot of talent already in the company. So who wants to come work over here? Because we're doing cool stuff, working on interesting problems uh, or come work with your friends. And then uh, the other thing you want to do is that you want to uh, uh, so seed talent, transfer talent, and then get every customer around the mission. The mission is we're growing the business, not that you're going to have this one little job for the next, you know, next three, four years. There's going to be growth for everybody. So now people see it as an opportunity to drive growth. Yeah. So it, quick tap on that, that breakdown. I, I mean, you know, that's one thing that I, you know, we were just talking about working backwards and what it's like to be inside of Amazon. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, I'm sure. But <laughs> I cannot wrap my hand around the, and I'd love to hear sort of the position here is that, so I'm sitting here, I'm trying to grow my team, right? I'm trying to build the best team that I possibly can. I want, you know, the bar raiser, which you talked about before, bring 50%, you know, has to be at least 50% better than, you know, the team or the, the existing team. I'm now not only concerned about potentially external, uh, you know, poaching of talent. I've got to worry about internal teams stealing my best, guys and girls in the business, what does that actually feel like when you're going through this, trying to hit these goals and these targets, be super resourceful? I mean, is there not a level of stress around that? No. Uh, to me, no. I mean, to me, for me, it wasn't, um, I, I didn't feel stressed as a negative thing. I felt stressed as a positive challenge, you know, stress like a violin string on a Stradivarius. But, uh, you know, a couple things to keep in mind uh, that I kept in mind is one, uh, I try to play the long game. And, and what I mean by that is uh, Amazon and otherwise, like, I just love meeting people, find out and what their talent, skills and desires are. Um, and then, you know, when anybody who's working on my team, you know, I try to say, look, um, I'm here to meet, help you meet your career goals. Hopefully working at Amazon or, or what, hopefully working at Foundry now in this case, hopefully we're at Foundry or Vantage, my other company, uh, and, and hopefully working together with me. And if there comes a point in time where uh, this doesn't meet your career goals, this role or working for, for, for me doesn't do that, then let's help get you to the right one. Uh, because the referral bonus, we are so networked today, right? And 10 years ago, right? Because around 2009, actually a little over 10 years ago, we weren't quite as networked formally with LinkedIn, et cetera, but we're certainly linked. Uh, we're certainly networked uh, um, in internal. We're certainly not informally. And so the more people that I can get helping me find the right people for the, the roles that I'm hiring for, um, that's just going to pay off. So the things I would manage is you can't control. I mean, eventually use the hiring manager control, making that right offer. Um, you can control how many candidate resumes you look at. You can also control how many people did you talk to about the role you're trying to hire for uh, and get feedback. So I would often look up, let's say I'm hiring for a, uh, a senior UX design manager. I don't know a lot about that position or maybe as much as I should. Uh, and, and it's just been assigned to me and we need it for the company to grow. Um, so I might write up a job description, borrow from some other posting a little bit. And then I will call up I'll ask three or four people, who's the best senior UX design manager you know, right? And I'd get three, four names. And I'm not thinking about poaching. I'm thinking about, uh, I'm going to call that person, say, hey, can I buy you coffee? Can I buy you lunch? I'm hiring for this role. Would this be a job? To I'm sure you're happy right now, uh, but I'd love to learn more about it. Would this be a position that's exciting to you? Do you know anyone who is looking that would be exciting? If it's not exciting, what would you change about it, right? That it would be exciting for you. Um, and eventually I'm just, I'm creating a relationship with that person. I just created a network of referrers and referrals. And eventually I'm going to start having people call me saying, Hey, I'm, I'm looking for this position. Are you hiring for that? Do you know anybody? That's one thing that both helps you get more talent and makes your positions a little more poach proof. 
second thing is I would work with my team on kind of a, you know, if this is, is this position helping you meet a career goal, right? We would change our, our, cause you can change the strategy or the work that you're doing a little more easily than the people. So, you know, can we, what would make this role this year uh, attractive to you and something you're proud of to put on your LinkedIn profile? Because if people are doing the work they want to do on your team and in your space, one, they're going to tell other people about it. Two, they're probably going to stay. Uh, now, that does mean you have to be honest sometimes. So, you know, I'm, I'm checking with, I would, I would expect and tell people, like, look, you don't have to stay in this role forever. We're not getting married. I need you to stay for at least six months. I need you to stay for at least a year, right? By the way, I want you to look around. And if you see something else that's attractive to you, don't want you to look around every day, maybe once a year. If you see something else that looks attractive to you, I'd love the chance to talk to you and see if we can change your job here a little bit to bring that element in, right? Um, and so that's how I made things a little bit poach proof. Um, but like I said, you have to back that up. So I had a guy who worked for me for three years. He's like, you know, I really want to have an overseas stint. I'm like, I don't have anything. Let me call a couple people. I helped him find an overseas stint, but I got to control the timing a little bit. Um, I had a boss early on in my Amazon career who was uh, uh, very blunt and very forward. Uh, he's like, you should never be surprised when someone leaves. Uh, he's like, it's, you know, maybe not desirable to have someone leave, but you should never be surprised. Uh, and it was helpful as I unpacked that because that meant I had to learn a lot. Uh, and it forced you like, are you checking in with your people? Are you, are you knowing why they leave? Right? It creates a good feedback loop. So there's a quick ramble on, you know, how are you hiring fast and, uh, and how are you becoming poach proof? I mean, you're, you know, you're treating team members as team members and you're actually giving them and empowering them to help take control of their future and their relationship with you. And then you're also extending and like you said, sort of expanding on that network to, to find other potential people. And if you can build that sort of positive experience and it's not a feedback loop, but it, you know, a sphere of influence, let's say, you can really start to achieve a whole lot more. So now I understand why you wouldn't be too concerned about people being poached because it's an open conversation when you can have dialogue that's that candid and transparent, um, you know, a whole lot more is, you know, is possible just in general. Yeah. If I, if I get the chance to work with an employer, work with you, be like, Yoni, you know, what, you know, let's, let's lay out the next 12 month goals. Um, and let's make sure they're attracted to you. Now, every quarter, you know, I may check in every, you know, six to 12 weeks, like how are we doing, you know, our new career goals, because uh, plans change, right? Uh, and then often with my key leaders, I'm, I'm meeting with them after we do our annual planning. Well, is this attractive? Are you going to be proud to put this on your LinkedIn, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm literally on the back of this call. I'm going to steal a bunch of these things and integrate them into our process. So brilliant. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So I do want to ask you maybe one or two more questions about Amazon because I'm particularly interested about what you're doing in Foundry. And I know, you know, you have lots of conversations about your time at Amazon and it's obviously something that's been influential in your career. But the, the last thing that I can think of right now, don't hold me to it, is when we talk about the interviewing process at Amazon and the fact that, you know, every single person potentially or at least senior leadership, they're all going to have to go through that hiring process. And so one of the challenges we have today is how do we continue to educate every single person in the business to be able to hire and continue to improve? What does that, it's either a half day or one day training look like at Amazon in helping you know everyone in the business actually learn how to hire? Yeah. You know, I think you mentioned you, you, you recently read the Working Backwards book. I think Bill and, and Colin do a great job in that, uh, giving a little bit of the overview of a process, right? They even start like it stops at the job description. Like what's the what's the work to be done that we're trying to match? And and then from that work, we can go, what, uh, what are different skills, different domain knowledge, different approaches um, that, that I'm going to look for? Now, you know, if we've actually gotten to that and we've, we've talked through, and so one, just think about the effort you're going to put into hiring to go back, that's 200 people. I may look at 10 resumes um, or 10 LinkedIn profiles to get to one candidate that I call on the phone. I may look at five people on the phone before I or talk to five people on the phone before I actually bring someone on site. Amazon is a very uh, 
resource intensive funnel. A um, couple of reasons, right? You don't want to set someone up to fail. And, and then also Amazon is to run this balance. If the worst thing you do is turn a great customer into a bad customer or a non-customer because they had a horrible interview experience, right? So, uh, so Amazon is also follows this policy of they're willing to wait uh, for a great hire or a bar raising hire uh, than necessarily bring someone in too soon or early. Um, I modify that a bit uh, with Foundry or with some of the consulting work I've done because the cost of hiring may not be uh, I don't need as high a, a cost bar because um, we may be having a, a lower commitment or less impact on my overall company. But but the important part is, so by the time someone gets to an Amazon onsite, you know, this is a pretty pretty big deal and, and pretty investment. So Amazon's going to have them talk to four to six people. Uh, and when I'm training for that, you know, I'll train interviewers uh, to remember you have 45 to 60 minutes to gather evidence to make a decision whether you want to give this person tens of thousands of dollars, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So, you know, do you really, there's no fence sitting, right? You either trust this person is going to help you and your team deliver on company goals and keep growing the Amazon company at 20, 30 plus percent, right? Uh, can this person invent their own methods of work? Can they do this? And you got 45 minutes to make that call uh, and, and to make your vote. Um, now, fortunately, it's not all dependent on you. Amazon interviews as a team and they're gonna look at this evidence and a bar raise from hiring manager is gonna pull it together. So that means I have no coffee questions. Uh, you know, from the time I pick you up at the lobby and we're walking to the interview room, I'm gathering evidence. Are you jet lagged? How excited were you about this interview? How much research did you do? Do you understand the position? Do you understand what success looks like? Do you understand, uh, do you have a questions? Uh, for senior candidates, one of my first questions when we sit down is like, great, thanks Kevin Day, before we get too far started, what questions do you have for me? Yeah, how can I help you make a good decision about this role or Amazon? So by this time, they've probably talked to three to five people and a senior leader in your group, when you talk about someone's scale, if they've done some research, one of the things about their job is going to be defining the problem or figuring out the work that needs to be done. So let's start now, right? Uh, how much have they done of that, right? And, and so I'm looking for how they're thinking, what are they grabbing? Uh, Amazon is testing, you know, what, how well do you fit to Amazon's leadership principles and perform against them as well as domain skills, right? Cause I'm gonna hire like, how's this person gonna fit in the team? Maybe they're super great at something because if I've gathered evidence of what they're great at, then I can assess later after the interview, is this a good fit for this role or a good fit for the company in general? Cause you may find out, I had one, you know, one person that were like, you know, they're really good at a lot of stuff. They're not a perfect fit to this role. Um, they're probably actually not better than 50% of the people in this role, but man, they were really good at project organization communication. Um, called them back three months later, said, I hope we didn't, hope we didn't told to turn you off to Amazon uh, when we said no the last time. Uh, but I have a role that I think would be perfect for you now, if you're still interested. Uh, person was, ends up getting promoted really fast because we put them right in the right fit. But that worked because we started by interviewing and gathering evidence about what the person was great at. And then we did the, the fit to role second. Um, and because you don't know what you're going to, what needs you're going to have in your company three, six, 12 months from now, if, if your company's on a big growth path. Yeah. And I can imagine with a company like Amazon, you're really aggregating and storing that data in a position where you can quickly and very easily understand where that might fit in another seat in the, you know, in the business. Yeah. So you're not doing that double work. Yeah. It makes, make, makes a lot of sense. All right. Um, I don't want to keep hitting you up on all the Amazon related questions. I know you are working on an enormous project right now in Foundry. And when I sort of look in from, from the outside, at what it is you guys are trying to achieve here, you know, and I know you've done a significant, you know, series A or first round raise. I mean, how does, how do you even think that far into the future in looking at the trends and the markets and building out the vision of what that looks like? You know, you're building a company with scale from, from the inception point. Yeah, it's, uh, Last year, this time, I think there was five or seven. Well, I guess by now, maybe it was just a touch more. But uh, you know, companies who had 
announced that they're going to buy Amazon brands. They're going to buy FBA brands. And, you know, by account last couple of weeks, it's we're well into the, you know, fifties uh, plus of companies who've raised some money. And so they're going to go buy some brands, uh, FBA brands. So, uh, you know, some of it is, uh, I guess there's two principles that I'd rest on. Um, one is as you project forward, start with what, you know, just remind yourself of what will continue to be true, right? Or what would need to be true uh, in order for your, your prediction to, to occur. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be true that we're going to continue to have direct to consumer grow and, and customers are, are going to continue to buy things that they can't go to a store to get and they're going to enjoy that convenience of it. So I think we're going to continue to, to see e-commerce company grow. So it's valuable uh, to, to um, uh, you know, focus on e-commerce, to focus on marketplaces, to be aware. Amazon certainly has a big head start, but even Jeff you know, said Amazon's not going to be around forever or is very likely. If, and the reason why he said that is the second principle that I would focus on is look for historical parallels, right? So uh, what we're doing at Foundry is we're transforming a historical business model, Church and Dwight, Procter and Gamble, there are brand portfolios uh, that have existed for yeah, is it centuries um, that Pro have been probably out. right. Um, but this is just a new opportunity to apply those models, and th that will take some transformation, right? But we can start from the historical parallel, right? Even Jeff's day one speech actually comes from the the historical parallel of of uh, electric motors and Sears catalog selling electric motor. You'd have one for your house. Uh, and you just hook up different things to your motor, right? We'd have one computer and you access the internet. Now you access the internet so many different ways. Uh, so I think we can look for historical parallels to say, all right, right now it's a little messy uh, for these brand acquisitions. Everybody's doing it a slightly different way, but maybe there's a real estate parallel, right? Uh, I get really excited at Foundry and we've started to build out analytics platform that would say, whether it's us or someone else, uh, what's a one-click LOI going to look like, right? You can always get a second LOI uh, to uh, a second opinion or a second LOI if you're exiting your business. Um, what would that look like? Uh, will How can we help founders who are exiting plan their exit a little bit better, right? They got so excited. They started a business. It took off. Should they exit now, right? How can we, how, how can we give them some analytics tools or how can we give them some planning tools to make that? Uh, assessment. Right now, I think you have to talk to somebody, right? You talk to a broker, you talk to your buddy, you do some mastermind group, uh, but I don't see a ton of tools out there yet. So historical parallel is real estate now has more tools. Real estate now has more self-service. Uh, and so that could be one parallel that analytics for online brands will go. Uh, those are the two principles to try to project the future that, that we get excited about at Foundry. Uh, is you know how do we what will continue to be true? The founders will continue to be valued. Uh, they learn something. They'll often want to do it again. How do we help them write that story, both in their exit and beyond? Uh, and then how do we uh, build analytics as we move from things that are maybe very handcrafted or very bespoke uh, to make them more self-service and to make them more uh, data-oriented and standardized? Uh, that's a common parallel for brand portfolios. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally just sitting here trying to unpack the, the analytics side of what it is to, to sell a brand or to sell your business that is a brand that you've created as a founder. And I think there are so many unknowns, and so many variables that exist. And, you know, given the fact that, you know, it's not yesterday wasn't the first time someone sold their brand to be it an aggregator or a consolidator or anyone else for that matter, it's been going on for uh, you know, that's what venture capital and, and private, equity, and, you know, private equity does, right? So to have an analytics platform that can help you actually make better decisions on, well, what is the, you know, what is the diminishing returns on this? What can I actually foreseeably manage from a long-term perspective, whether it's around cash flow and how much I can continue to reinvest in the business? What's the growth trajectory? And at what point is this going to, Geez, I forgot the principle, the, not the Peter principle, the one where you elevate yourself to a, a state of incompetence. Um, no, yeah. 
there's a Peter principle in that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is it? A Dober principle. Uh, I'm not sure. No, there's is certain because uh, as a as a, uh, as a founder and you're in an exit process, right? That's not an emotion free process, right? So you're also you know, are you in a good state? You have good uh, resources to make those decisions. Um, the uh, you know, should you take an earnout? How much of your how much of your exit should be on an earnout? And then on the flip side, you know, somebody like you know our group like Foundry, you know, we literally have you know, across our, our team, I think every, every ex Amazon person on our team was in marketplace or retail uh, with nearly a decade, I think some of his eight and a half years, uh, maybe nine years of, of Amazon experience. Uh, and so, well, who do you want to trust to help drive your earnout uh, if your earnout is heavily dependent on Amazon? And then all of us have also uh, worked uh, beyond Amazon in other marketplaces uh, or D2C. Uh, so we're a heavily operator oriented group uh, that I think we're, we're pretty confident in our capabilities we have or we're building uh, to be a good place to grow your brand. But maybe that's not your objective either, right? So people, you know, founders should choose the exit that meets their objectives, whether it's the growth uh, or whether it's just a, hey, I'd like it up front or whether it's a future, future opportunities, right? Does it connect them to the opportunities for the next thing they want to do? product development, brand development, uh, marketing, investing. Yeah. And, and as someone who's spoken to, you know, uh, uh, I think the entire founding team, I mean, it's just incredible the, the, the sheer talent pool that you have. And the, you know, like I said, every time I seem to get on a conversation with you, I'm sort of elevated and I learn a whole lot more. And I could say the same for, you know, for the rest of the team too. It's really, it's exciting to see what you guys are cooking up and just how, it all comes together. I, I, I've got to say as well, um, I met um, Andy for the first time uh, the other yeah. day. And geez, I've never had someone grill me on such like, <laughs> high, but, but high level questions, questions that usually don't come up in a first meeting or a first conversation about topics like that. It's just so well thought out, had been there before, had you know, honestly thought about things that, you know, even me running a business in, in you know, the staffing space, I'm not thinking of on the day to day. Those were sort of early ideas. So, you know, it's just, it's incredible to see sort of the, the, the level. And so that brings me to sort of my next question. I know you guys did um, a strategy week. I'm not sure what you guys exactly called it, but I know you got together. Um, you're putting together these huge plans about, you know, all the brands that you're going to acquire, how you're going to manage them in market, how you're going to grow these brands and whatever the future looks like. What goes what goes into a planning week like that or, or however long it was? I'm, you know, I'm curious. Well, yeah. So uh, first of all, it's two days. So we compressed a week to two days, get a lot of work done. Uh, you know, but Foundry is a distributed company, uh, you know, because we're starting and inventing, you know, post COVID uh, and coming together, it gives us the opportunity to get great talent and, and operate distributed from day one. Uh, and then come together in person as needed or on a cadence to make hard decisions or good decisions face to face. Right? Uh, there are reasons people should go to the office, and some of us you get to watch, you know, other people work or learn. And so some they are our, our month. You know, right now it's kind of happening monthly, but we monthly strategy session. Uh, and it's you know, hey, are we on track? So we've already made kind of what the goals we have for 2021. We want, you know, we want to hire a number, we want to acquire a number of companies. We have some key hires. Uh, and so coming into being together face to face, we can look at, you know, uh, what got done, what didn't get done, what did we learn? Uh, and do we need to make hard trade-offs uh, to, uh, to achieve goals if we, if we didn't have, uh, if we didn't have success we needed? Um, uh, you know, there's some some math that we need to work together or whiteboard sessions we needed to do. Uh, we talked about the analytics platform, uh, the sequence that we were uh, that that we're hiring and building. Well, it, I, you know, had to make a hard choice. Uh, I chose to wait for a hire uh, rather than hire someone who you know, was really eager, but um, didn't have quite as much domain skills as I would have liked. Uh, and so, you know, it's going to be better for us to wait. Um, we can either outsource or we can uh, slow down. 
But then I had to work through the trade-offs on the other parts of our business. How does that impact integration? Uh, we're gonna have to do some extra manual steps. Uh, can we work with a company who can help us benchmark and define our operations? Um, I think you might know one of those. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, you know that doing that face to face helps still build the trust, right? Because when you're already distributed, you're not in the office. It's it's easy for other interpersonal dynamics to happen, right? People don't, you know, people tend to fill the void of ambiguity, um, not always with with great things. So we love being distributed because we can, you know, work with great people where they are. I think we've got, you know, uh, we started another great guy, Kevin Bates out of Grand Rapids, Michigan, my hometown. Um, people in Seattle, we have one employee who's like, great, I don't have to live. I'm going to move to Hawaii uh, and, and realizes the time shift that, that she's going to have to do to do that. But uh, then, then the strategy session comes to play and says, um, what trade-offs do we need to make to either when things are going well, how do we double down uh, and check our priorities to go faster? Right? What do we want to do at Prosper? You know, how do we want to how do we want to talk to people at Prosper? What uh, what point are we going to be at our company to be able to uh, share and, and work with service providers to be the first first choice exit uh, for a founder? Uh, so that's what we do at the strategy session. Is you know, let's look at our numbers and and how are we trending on our numbers? What trade offs do we need to make to go faster? Uh, look at the, the building work that we're doing, whether it's hiring or whether it's some of the uh, pipeline or software tools. And, and then lay out, okay, what are the next 30 day goals? Um, and where do we need to check in with each other uh, on, on those goals? If there's any trades we need to make. Yeah, make, makes a lot of sense. And on that, how, how far out in general are you guys planning? Like, uh, is, is it a a BHAG, you know, we're we talking about 10 years down the line of what it's going to look like. Are you sort of doing it incrementally, you know, the year strategy session? Like what, is, what does that look like for you guys at this stage? Yeah, for us, it, it, it looks like a, a, a 30 days, one year and, and three years, right? So uh, if we're going to be a premier brand portfolio company three years from now, right? Look to estimate the size of the change, look three years back. Or none of these three years back. I don't think Thrasio is existing three years back. I don't right? think so either. So, so start. So three years from now, we can hold pretty loosely. Yeah. What? But that does inform like which direction we're going to go, right? Uh, I believe, and so we talk about this a little bit. Do we think it's going to be true that three years from now, a brand company? Well, let me keep going back. One year from now, like what? Um, we might say three years from now, how many brands will we have? What size will we be? What capabilities will we be? How big of a customer base will we have, right? I don't hear a lot of brand companies or these portfolios talking about their customer base. And that's really what a brand is, right? Your brand is a great set of products that has an engaged customer base and a valuable set of customers they serve. So then in the one year, what's the bite this year toward that three year? And there we'll get a little more precise. How many do we need to acquire 50 or five brands this year? Or maybe it's not a number. We need to acquire how much EBITDA and what types of EBITDA across different brands. Right? Maybe we're willing to buy and we'd love, we have a great funding partner. We'd love to acquire maybe a little bit larger brand or a set of brands. Um, uh, out there and then work around that. So we have an anchor. Um, so we, we think about that in the one year, but those are much more financial and, and capability driven. And then the 30 day is much more transactional and more of a swarming, almost sprint style in, in uh, software. So, you know, are we on the right track? So when you have a conversation with Andy or a conversation, like they're able to keep the three-year mind in view. What do we believe will be true three years from now? What do we need to hit this year? And then for the next 30 days, are we doing work that's going to put us on track? What's the most impactful work and the biggest trade-offs we can do to hit these one-year goals? And in that, we can also change. I mean, the multiples, right? What people are seeing crazy multiples for an 80, 90% Amazon business. Okay, there's other great places that brands born online. Maybe we should, if we didn't look at an 80% business, maybe we should look at a, uh, or maybe, uh, maybe we should look at a business that's more mixed. Well, that's the big change of the model because now you have to, all this stuff that Amazon does for free for you. Uh, well, not for free, but Amazon takes off your plate. In a DDC world, you need a solution for that, right? So now let's work that through. That's a whiteboard. 
um, and, and assess. And so that's that 30 day to uh, one year to three in keeping those in view. Yeah. I mean, so many things to consider when you sort of deviate from the typical FBA business to, you know, global expansion, where the brand lives, you know, even the consideration of brick and mortar, the, the sales cycle or to get stocked and to remain there is a whole, you know, it's a whole nother can of worms. Are those, you know, those brands that you guys would be interested in? Is that something that has appeal having that diversification? Or is that something that, you know, you look at it and you say, well, this is creating too many variables. Yeah, you know, uh, we're interested in talking to all founders, you know, the best brands born online. Our focus, you know, our first focus is like many with brands with a, a very heavy Amazon presence and a large portion of their business currently on Amazon. And, but our team includes uh, myself and others, uh, you know, people who've built successful D2C businesses. And so we are, if, if there's a business, well, we're 50% D2C and 50% Amazon, but as part of the business, you're buying their solution to D2C, mm -hmm. um, we'd be glad to talk to them. Uh, because again, what we believe through this is a sequencing question. When you change the time frame, it what feels like a strategy question now can actually turn into a sequencing question. Three years out, you know, every premier brand portfolio is, I believe, going to be multi-channel and multi-country. So it's just a question of when, right? And so if you are um, instead of well, do we do that or not? Uh, yes or no, it's a, is it now or later uh, is the question. And what are the trade-offs to change the sequence? Um, and that, that's a, that changes the way that you can make that strategy question. Um, if you presume success or assume success, build for success, and you understand kind of where a three-year success is, then that keeps that 30, that three-year, one-year and 30-day uh, and, and in view. Yeah, um, lots. You've given me lots to think about, Stefan, on how we sort of, you know, forecast out what we're doing, and and I think a lot of people listening would probably, hopefully, be having some of the same realizations that I'm having right now if they haven't already. Um, but before I let you go, because I just want to be mindful of your time here, and can't believe we've eaten up the entire duration here. I could sit here and ask you questions forever. Um, what would be the best way for anyone looking to sell their brand, have a conversation, become a, you know, a, a member of the growing foundry team? What's the best way to get in touch with either you or, or someone in the team? You bet. So we'd love to have you come to, you know, triple W foundry uh, We have a simple form up there. If you're interested in becoming part of our team, interested in, in talking to us about your exit uh, from, from your brand or even whether it's ready and whether it's time now to be acquired first. Remember, I still like the long-term game. We've got a contact form there. Our LinkedIn page uh, on, on LinkedIn for Foundry uh, is another great way. And then I'm also very easy to connect with on LinkedIn. Uh, and and uh, if any of those gets more complicated, so just Stefan Haney uh, on LinkedIn and, and I'll get you connected to the right people. Well, awesome, mate. Thanks so much for sitting down. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've learned a lot and I'm sure a lot of people at home will too. No, I, I, we can help more people scale their businesses and, and support their families and communities. It's a great thing to do. Glad to help. Awesome. Thanks, mate.